What is up, Brian here from Ballistic Tech. Thank you guys for checking out this video. I am actually recording this hot off the heels of coming back from the East Coast Rep Rap Festival. One of the things I picked up was this new shirt. So I wanna send a huge shout out to Hector from Fabrico. And that's pretty appropriate because I actually have a few upgrades on this guy. Uh, which come from Fabrico and I use some Fabrico tools to build it. So today we're going to be checking out this guy. This is the Formbot Boron V0.2 kit. It's a tiny 3D printer with a lot of capabilities and functionality. It features a pretty compact Core XY kinematic system that's going to offer really, really fast printing. It does have a very simple cantilever bed. It is a very small printer with a build volume of 120 by 120 by 120 millimeters. But with that small size, you get very fast heating and an overall low power consumption. There's no ABL or mesh, uh, mesh bed leveling on this printer. It is fully enclosed, which means it's capable of printing a lot of hotter materials like ABS and ASA. This does of course work off of Clipper by the default kind of setup that the Voron team recommends. So you get a huge number of mods and macros and a lot of capability that you can build into the printer. So the V0 is one of the most popular Voron printers and it's an entry point for a lot of people looking to build their first kind of DIY Core XY machine. Kits have become the primary way most people are going about building these machines these days. Self-sourcing is becoming more and more rare. It's just really, really hard to match the kind of cost savings that you get from shipping and having everything come together in one box. Different people want different things out of a kit. They place value on different aspects of it. Some people really care about the speed and ease of the build. Some people care primarily about the quality of the components and parts. Some people really, really value having good documentation and support. And some people really, really value and want to, you know, um, spend their money with a company that has a, you know, great reputation, has a very collaborative um, nature with the whole 3D printing community. In addition to that, some people are looking to build a kit exactly as it comes and that's how they're gonna keep it. Others have dozens of mods already planned out even before they, you know, purchase the kit. They've kind of specced out the build that they want to have in the future. You might be looking for as many value adds and features out of the box as possible, while somebody else wants a bare minimum kit because they plan to, you know, completely overhaul it and mod it and maybe get some kind of a crazy speed demon or turn it into one of the really, really cool projects from Printers for Ants. This is actually my very first Voron printer build. I have been playing with the Voron ecosystem by printing out the Voron Stealth Burner tool head and the M4 extruder that I put on my TiVo Tornado, but I'm certainly no expert at building Vorons. This is actually my very first Core XY machine that I'll be building and running. But to get familiarized with everything, I watch streams and content from folks like Steve Bills, Nero 3D, uh, Mandic Really, Modbot, and a lot of others. So yeah, while I'm not an expert, hopefully this provides a good perspective from a somewhat well-informed but still, you know, very newcomer points of view. So standard YouTube review disclaimer here, this printer was provided by Formbot for the purpose of making uh, content around it. I was not paid to feature this printer at all. I have full editorial control. My goal isn't really to sell you this kit, but kind of to outline the features, completeness, quality, and value adds to hopefully make it easier for you to compare this kit to other kits and make an informed buying decision. I'll outline how I found the build process, issues I ran into because of the kit and places where I think it can be improved. That said, I do have links in the description if you do want to check this kit out. And if you buy it with those links, it supports the channel and helps me make these videos more frequently and better. One thing I do want to note is I have a GitHub repo linked in the description for this kit. It's got a base config for Clipper that you're going to be able to use and it matches up, you know, perfectly as the kit comes from Formbot. I've got information about the issues I ran into, all the solutions I used to solve those issues. I've got very, very detailed wiring diagrams for the whole printer and a couple of different configurations for the Kirigami bed. I've got all of the extra products and mods that I have put on the build. So a little bit of a build log, a little bit of a resource, and hopefully you guys will find that useful to get your kit built if you do choose to pick it up. So let's dig into this printer kit. So several V0 kits in the price range from like 300 
all the way up to like 800 plus dollars. Manufacturers are looking to kind of differentiate their offerings with a number of different value adds. This does come in at a base price of $329 before shipping with, you know, no features added. And there are several different options depending on if you buy directly from Forbot or if you go to AliExpress. Some of those different options include the warehouse that you buy from. On the Formbot side, there are a couple of hot end options. The base hot end is the CHC V6 style hot end from Formbot, but you can upgrade to a Fetish Dragon for a $40, I think it is premium, or a Dragon High Flow for a $50 premium. And they also offer ABS parts at a $60 premium. Printed parts are a way that companies are differentiating their products. This doesn't come with any injection molded or CNC parts. I believe that they mentioned that their printed parts are a glass filled ABS and that they ship directly from China, regardless of what warehouse you purchase the actual kit from. They're always going to ship from China, but that's kind of included in the base price of buying the printed parts. So if you don't choose to pick up their printed parts, you're going to have to print them yourself or you can source them from any of the wide range of different options. You've got Voron Pith or Printed Forward, where you can apply to a queue and you pay a person who will print your Voron parts on their Voron printer. Fabrico also has CPIF, which is a commercial PIF program where you can pay them and a person, again with the Voron, will print out your parts and ship them to you. So if you're really, really looking to get them pretty fast, that's one of the best options. There are, of course, a lot of shops you can get them from, like places on Etsy, eBay, AliExpress, and a lot of the other shops kind of in the same vein as Fabrico. I went with the Fabrico CPIF program, and I've been really, really happy with the parts so far. It generally provides you with all the parts, not just like the functional parts, which are necessary to get it printing, everything including the skirts and all the side panel pieces and things like that, which are considered more decorative. One thing I do want to note is that I got the V0.2 version of the kit. The V0.2 R1 revision of the printer design has come out while I was building it. And, you know, I built it basically as the V0.2. And then towards the end of the process, I swapped in some of the V0.2 R1 parts. The offering from Formbot right now should be a V0.2 R1 kit. Make sure if they have any different variations that you purchase that one. They do have the filament runout sensor parts listed in their new updated bomb. I can't speak to the quality of those because they did not come with my kit, but it's essentially like a bearing, a little micro switch for you to be able to kind of detect whether the filament is running through the filament pack. In terms of the value adds and features, a few notable ones that I wanted to mention up front are that it comes with a Kirigami bed frame, a Big Tree Tech Pi B1.2 single board computer, the Big Tree Tech SKR Pico board. It also has the V0 display, the V0 umbilical. I already mentioned that CHC V6 hot end. It also has double sided PEI plates. It comes with pretty much all pre crimped and cut to length wiring. It utilizes Moon's motors. It does utilize what they say are stainless steel rails. It has a mix six cast aluminum bill plate that is paired with a Vividino 60 watt silicone bed heater. And it utilizes polycarbonate side panels. It comes with gate belts. All the hardware is uh, stainless steel and it features a Meanwell 150 watt PSU. I think overall, this is a pretty good mix of mods and upgrades. It strikes a pretty good balance between, you know, improvements over the standard V0 mod and a lot of things that people are typically already putting on their printer while keeping the price relatively low at a base price of $329. Getting a little bit more into detail on some of the features and value adds, we'll start with the Big Tree Tech Pi V1.2. This is an alternative single board computer and with a similar footprint as the Raspberry Pi 3. It works pretty well. It seems powerful enough. It utilizes a quad core Cortex a53 processor or MCU at 1.5 gigahertz. That's around the power of a Pi 3B, I believe in terms of performance. It has one gigabyte of RAM, but that RAM is actually faster than a standard Pi 3 RAM. This actually utilizes the exact same image as the Big Tree Tech CB1 compute module, which is utilized on a lot of their Manta boards and their board lineup. It is officially supported by Armbian, which is great to see. Big Tree Tech is a platinum supporter 
of the Airbnb project. So this is kind of an official image. So in terms of longevity, that looks pretty good. I found it really easy to get set up, almost easier than a typical Raspberry Pi using Raspberry Pi Imager. All I had to do was add my Wi-Fi info to the supplicant file and it booted up and showed up on my network super, super fast. There are two different versions of the image. There's a minimum kernel version, which you can then you know download the Clipper installer and update helper application to install all the Clipper things that you want, or you can get to the Clipper kernel, which has everything pretty much pre-installed, and then you just have to update everything. So far, I've really, really enjoyed using it. I use it just like I do a typical Raspberry Pi, and you know, those are kind of up and down in terms of availability and pricing. A lot of scalping has been going on, so this is a great thing to have. It is reusable for other projects. You can use it just like you would a, a Raspberry Pi for something like a arcade cabinet or any other projects that you might use a Pi for. Some cool differentiators versus a typical Pi include that it has colored GPIO headers on there so you can see where the five volts, three volts, grounds, GPIO pins are to make sure you don't accidentally short out your Pi. The wireless seems to work really, really well. As I mentioned, it showed up on my network really, really fast. It does have some enhancements over a standard Pi including a dedicated ADXL 345 port. It has 4K HDMI output. It utilizes USB-C instead of micro USB. And it actually has a dedicated port for USB to CAN bus modules. So that's a pretty cool feature there. There's also numerous ways to power it. You can power it via the GPIO. That's how Formbot has you doing it. You can also power it via 12 to 24 volts coming straight out of your power supply and you can power it via five volts over USB-C. So really, really adaptable there. All right, next up we have the V0 umbilical. This is a very popular mod by Timmet from the Voron design team. It makes wiring, cable management, and just maintenance of the printer and upgrading very, very easy. It comes with two PCBs, a tool head PCB, a frame PCB, and then a Molex connector to go between them. So up at the tool head, you plug in all of the things on the tool head to get data and power. So your hot end, your thermistor, your power cooling fans, your extruder fans and your extruder motor. From there, it goes into the frame PCB and the frame PCB breaks all of that, those data signals and, and power signals out to go down to the main board. So that offers uh, a lot of benefits like shorter runs of cables. You don't have to run cables out of your main board all the way up to the tool head. And it comes actually with pre-cut and pre-crimped wiring because as Nero says, crimping ain't easy. Next up, we have the, again, very popular Kirigami bed frame. This is another user mod that has become almost ubiquitous with a lot of V0 builds. It's included in a lot of V0 kits as well. Check out the GitHub repo from the original creator of this, Christoph. I'll have a link to it in the description below, and it's also linked in the GitHub that I have for this printer kit. So the Kirigami bed frame is a nice rigid bed frame and it replaces the default multi-extrusion bed frame that is designed in the Boron B0 bomb. So it reduces a lot of the complexity for building the frame. The parts that you source might have 3D printed parts for the original bed and the Kirigami bed, but you need to make sure that you have all the appropriate parts for the Kirigami bed. For that, I recommend using the new Kirigami bed manual, which has a really, really good breakdown of the different parts you'll need depending on what kit you have and which features you want to include. I really like the Kirigami frame for making cable management and wiring of the bed super, super easy. It allows you to kind of break out the bed wiring similar to how we do with the V0 umbilical kit. You can use Wagos and other connectors to make disassembling the bed easier. And when you detach the bed, say you need to do something like replace the thermal fuse, you can completely pull the bed out and you're not tethered by you know, single runs of cable that go all the way from connected to your bed all the way to the main board. So breaking stuff out like that makes it easier to replace things, easier to do maintenance and easier to do upgrades. This only includes the Kirigami bed frame. So there's no wiring or LED. So if you want the NeoPixel on the front, if you want to break out the wiring so that you can easily disconnect things, you're gonna have to self source or you can actually buy a kit that's just the wiring kit from a distributor like Fabrico or DFH or KB3D and you can get that and it's made by LDO. So if you want all of that, you can do it. It's not required, 
but I think it makes the Kirigami kit a lot more worthwhile. V0 display designed by Timit. Again, that guy is awesome, but it's a small LED display designed specifically to work with the V0. Different kits will and won't include that display. Some include their own kind of custom version of the display, but it's a nice little handy thing to help see the status of the printer and make small changes while you're at the printer and you know not while you're sitting at your desk with the web UI. Moving on, we have polycarbonate panels, which is actually pretty unique. I'm not aware of any other V0 kits at the moment which feature polycarbonate panels. From what I've known from PC building is that a lot of case manufacturers are using polycarbonate because it's scratch resistant, it's fog resistant, it doesn't react as nearly as much to heat and sagging as acrylic does, so that's a nice little feature. The extrusions feature post cutting slash drilling anodization or powder coating. I'm not really sure. I think it's powder coated. Looking at it, it doesn't really look like anodization to me, but they look pretty nice. All of the extrusions were tapped on both sides. So that's something that you need to notice in order to be able to identify them and make sure you use the right extrusion in the right spot. In terms of the packaging and unboxing experience, I thought it was all fairly well packed. You can check out the whole unboxing in great detail in the first stream that I did. But really, you know, nothing was damaged. I thought the phone protection that was included in it was perfectly adequate. Everything was very well labeled in terms of the hardware and wiring. A couple of things I thought could have been better labeled were the actual panels. You should be able to identify pretty quickly after looking at the manual what panel is what, but if they were identified with just like a little, you know, Sharpie on the uh, protective film, that would have made it a little bit easier. Also the extrusions, those took me a while to identify what extrusion was what. So for all kit manufacturers, if you could kind of call out which extrusions are which, it'll save people, you know, probably like 15 to 20 minutes of time trying to identify where all the blind holes are, especially since all of them are tapped on both sides. It would just really, really make the build process a little bit easier to do. Compared to other kits, I've heard this referred to as a little bit more of a bomb in a box, bomb being build of merchandise. So just all the products thrown into a box. And I think that's kind of true, but I don't necessarily consider it a 100% negative. There's not a lot of like individually boxed sets of components, you know, all matched up together. So there's no box with just the motors in it. There's no box with just the bed stuff put all together with it. There's no box with all the tool head stuff with it or the frame or the panels, etc. On one hand, I can see this is a little bit of a plus because there's not a ton of extra and some would say excessive packaging included in the box. It's a very small box and you're not gonna be throwing away a ton of cardboard and separators and things like that. It's just really a kind of box full of individual components, hence the term bomb in a box. So on the flip side of that positive, it means that you're gonna have to sort through all of those components and organize them in a way that you'll be able to get to what you need when you need it, if you want a nice kind of pleasurable, expedited, concise build process. I actually did a whole stream where I organized and picked out the extrusions. Um, I kind of organized the printed parts and paired a whole bunch of parts like the uh, linear rails, you know, cleaning them and greasing them and things like that. So if you're like me and you like to null everything out, then getting a bomb in a box is just like another relaxing activity for you to set everything up with. But if you kind of prefer that experience of having everything set out for you in packages that are just like this part of the build, this part of the build, this part of the build, then it's a little bit lacking in that regard. Formbot does sell some individual components of the kit that you can pick up on their website. And I think on AliExpress, they've got a V0.1 to V0.2 slash R1 upgrade kit. So if you do have an older version of the kits, you can upgrade it. They also sell the V0 umbilical individually. They sell the Kirigami bed frame. You can get spare bed sheets if you want, and you can get some of the different wiring components. One thing I will note is there's not much in terms of printed documentation that comes with the kit. There are some motor drawings and specs which are really, really helpful for doing your clipper setup to set up the currents that you need for the different motors. But other than that, it is kind of bare on documentation in general. And that's kind of an overall theme. And one of the negatives I'll say about the kit is that there doesn't really exist any documentation outside of the official Voron documentation. So at times I was referring to the LDO documentation to kind of figure out how to do things for the Kirigami bed. Yeah, no quick getting started guide, no wiring documentation. I did mention I have that GitHub set up where I have a wiring diagram that you can refer to that should help you get started and kind of clear up where everything different goes. But that said, I will say that things like the wires were very, very clearly labeled and they are so plug and play, V0 umbilical that 
you know, you could argue that the wiring diagram isn't super important, but I think a lot of people, especially if it's kind of their first build of this complexity, having a nice wiring guide is a great thing. Next, I wanted to talk about completeness. Generally, I felt that this was a very, very complete kit. First, starting with the hardware, I had enough of absolutely everything. I actually printed out this little V0 hardware sorter that ModBot created. So I was able to take all the individual bags and put them into individual little drawers. So I had, you know, the inserts and the different size nuts and different size hardwares all labeled out for me. I find that a lot easier than kind of trying to reach into a bag and pour out the exact number of screws you needed, but they were very well labeled and I had more than enough of pretty much everything. One or two things that you may want to make sure that you don't lose are the belt tie downs for the carriage. There are two that are needed and you only get two of those. So just make sure you don't lose any of those. If you lose some random M3, M2 screws or nuts, then you should have enough extras that it wouldn't be a problem. The panels, all of those were present. The extrusions were all there. They don't include any extrusions for the bed because you don't need it for the wiring. Again, I already mentioned that everything was well labeled, pre-cut, pre-crimped. It made wiring pretty much plug and play. There were a few things in there to help with cable management. They have zip ties. They did have some sticky tie downs so that you can kind of bundle wires together and stick them in different parts. There was plenty of both types of Bowden tube. There should be Bowden tube that is four by three inner diameter, which is used for the reverse Bowden. And then there should be Bowden tube that is four by two millimeters inner diameter, which is used for inside of the tool head. Similar story with the belts. There was more than enough. I had some excess belt over there that I actually used for my vertical linear press that uh, Vector3D made. All of the electronics were present. Yeah, overall, I have to say for completeness, I had to give this a an A. I didn't have to dip into my own, you know, stash of hardware for anything. And that's really, really great. Uh, so now let's talk about quality of some of those components a little bit. I'm starting with the V6 CHC hot end. It's got the ceramic heater core, so the heat up time on it is pretty fast. It does feature hard mounting, so it's called the V6, but instead of having like a collet style mount or collar mount, it has basically a dragon mount with six screws, so you can orient it in a couple different ways. It has a bi-metal heat break, so it's all metal. And generally, I just say it's, you know, a decent little hot end that can get you going on the cheap. If you, you know, are really, really budget oriented and you're just trying to get the kit, then it will actually work. I did have a little bit of trouble with the THC hot end that they included. I tried to hot tighten it while it was already installed in the mini stealth burner. And while I was doing that, the wrench slipped because there just really isn't a lot of room in the mini stealth burner to fit it in and it hits the ceramic. Nope. I broke the ceramic on it. Son of emotional damage. And that ended up cracking. So that's a little bit of a bummer. I actually had a viewer, Truggy, who was watching the stream and mentioned he had bought this kit and got the same hot end and wasn't using it. So he sent it over. So I was able to actually use the hot end and do some testing with it. And yeah, I was able to get some pretty decent prints out of it. Compared to my Dragon High Flow with a CHT nozzle, of course, the max volumetric flow rate is really, really low in comparison. It's basically half. So yeah, you can get started printing with the default base configuration of this printer using that hot end but I would kind of recommend getting something different like a Boron Revo or something from Fates. For the Kirigami frame, I actually found it to be quite square out of the box. I didn't have to kind of bend it or contort it to ensure that the carriage flanges were coplanar. I did do a little bit of minor tweaking just to make sure that they aligned pretty well, but out of the box, compared to what I've seen from some other people posting on the Voron Discord, where they had to really, really tweak it, like they were really, really out of a line, I thought it came pretty, pretty square. I also think it's quite rigid. Twerking on it a little bit myself, I couldn't easily get it out of skew. I did have a number of problems with getting the bed installed in general, and I'll go into those in greater detail when I get to kind of the issues and improvements section. In terms of the actual heat bed, I'm pretty you know pleased with the quality of it. It seems to be very flat. I could see some milling marks on it. I'm not exactly an expert on you know having super flat milled beds. I'm used to working with like reality printers, which notoriously don't have the most flat beds. But since this is such a small printer, it's not crucial that it has an absolutely like crazy, crazy, crazy tight 
tightly tolerance milled bed like it doesn't need to be 0.00001 millimeter tolerances i ended up getting very consistent first prints out of this guy like i'm super happy with this this looks like it's a, a piece of craft uh american cheese it does heat up to 110 degrees 115 degrees i've gotten it up to which is plenty hot for all of the materials i'm printing like abs and asa I will say the 60 watt heater does kind of limit the heat up time of the printer in general. You know, the main source of heating up the chamber is the bed and heat up time is fairly, fairly slow. And then the chamber heat up time, if you're really printing a large print in one to make sure that the whole chamber gets up to like, you know, 40, 50 degrees C, then that's going to take a little while. The bed sheet and magnet also seem to be pretty good quality and quite flat. Again, it's textured on one side and flat kind of satin PEI on the other. Both seem to hold prints fairly well. The textured side holds like really, really well. I did have some trouble with very, very large prints that went basically across the whole print surface lifting up in the corners. And the way I ended up solving that was just allowing the whole thing to heat soak for a lot longer. So if you're gonna be doing, you know, prints that fill up the 120 by 120 by 120, definitely give it time to heat soak. In terms of the flat side, PLA printed really, really well on it. It of course doesn't need nearly as hot of a surface or as much of a texture. I did have a little bit of problem with some of the ABS prints and that sticking all that well to the flat side, but you know, some glue stick or any other type of adhesive will do you, you know, perfect for that and hold prints down pretty well. Again, if you heat soak it for long enough. The hardware, I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised with in terms of quality. I had zero bad nuts or screws. So like no nuts that just didn't have any spreads in them, no screws that weren't spreaded or anything like that. I did manage to strip the heads of a few of the screws, but I'm gonna go ahead and put that on me. When I started building this frame, as you'll see on the live stream, I utilized kind of like these little bits. They don't have the sharpest edges on them. I was also using some ball ends drivers. And what I ended up doing was switching to these kind of RC style drivers after a while. These are actually made by Fabrico. Got the branding right there. Once I switched to these, I had no problems at all. One quality thing I did want to call out is that the spacers weren't exactly to spec. They're supposed to be exactly 0.5 millimeters. And when I measured about 10 of them, they came out with a variance from 0.53 millimeters to 0.56 millimeters. That's not a ton. Ideally, but your ideally though, yeah. Ideally on an ideal situation. Ideally. They would be to spec, but with those shims, the most important thing is that when you put together these bearing stacks, they align really, really well. If they were, you know, all like 0.6 and some were 0.5 and it ended up causing your belt alignment to not be perfectly parallel, that would be an issue. I'd say, you know, 0.03 to 0.06 isn't all that much of a worry. And I haven't noticed any kind of weird wearing of my belts after hundreds of print hours. So I'll, I'll say that they work pretty well enough. That's definitely an area that they can improve on though. I've got to say, I was pretty happy with the quality of the extrusions. I really like that post cutting, drilling, tapping, anodization. They look really, really nice. They don't show a whole bunch of like silver edges, even though all of that ends up getting covered up in the final build. I didn't scratch them too easily. There are some areas where I did end up scratching them where I was preloading nuts with the little nut holders using one of these drivers trying to push it in because I tended to over extrude them a little bit to make sure that they didn't end up sliding, but they didn't scratch super, super easily just by moving them around or assembling. The ends were very well squarely cut. I measured them with my calipers and I noticed a variance of like 199.99 six to uh, 200.004. Very, very happy with the extrusion. The panels seemed pretty well and accurately cut, but what I really, really enjoyed about them is that they came in a thin plastic sheeting instead of that kind of paper brown adhesive, which if you've ever put together a kit that has that kind of cut acrylic, it takes forever to get off. If you don't pull it off at the right angle, then it shears and tears. Being able to just peel that plastic off super, super easy was really, really nice. The quality of the wires was again, pretty good. They typically included silicone sheathing and all of the crimps seemed to be really, really nice. All the JST housings and other connectors went into their connectors really, really well and I didn't have any problems. It was pretty much plug and play. All of these lengths of wires were really, really great. I'll say except the A and B wires, maybe they kept them long because they're not sure that everybody's gonna use the electronics that they provide. But if people do use the electronics, then there's no need for them to be 
nearly as long as they are. So I kind of had to deal with all that excess wire by kind of bounding it up and using some of their sticky tie downs. The rails were one of the parts that I was really kind of nervous about. I haven't really used any printers with linear rails. I've used other machines that have them, but I haven't been responsible for cleaning or greasing them. They didn't come in any crazy amount of shipping grease, which was nice. I didn't have to spend a ton of time degreasing them only to have to then re-lube them. I did lube them and they were fairly good quality from what I can see. There is one rail that is different from all of the others. It has a different preload and it's labeled that way. And it is for the X access. And yeah, overall, they're not particularly noisy. Fans override the sound of the kinematics way, way more than anything else in the build. So pretty happy with the rails as well. In terms of the belt, from what I can tell, they're actually legitimate Gates belt. There's nothing really to note about them. They haven't seemed to stretch excessively over time. I have kind of redone the kinematics a couple times and have been able to get them tuned to, I think it's like 110 hertz pretty well. So happy with those. The motors, not really anything spectacular to mention about those. The Moon's motors I hadn't used before, but they seem to be popular. The AB motors worked really, really well. The sensors homing works pretty well with them and I've been able to tune the current. The extruder motor seems to extrude really, really consistently. I didn't have any problems getting the mesh set up with that at all. The Z integrated lead screw seems to be pretty good quality too. I have seen where other kits have had issues with aggressive lead screw threading which has caused the nut block to kind of get stripped out, but I haven't had any issues with that. No binding on the Z, no Z wobble, so happy with all the motors. Fans and cooling. I'm gonna go ahead and say that these are probably the most likely elements to get swapped out by somebody on this kit. The fans were just kind of a no-name brand I wasn't familiar with. The plastic felt uh, kind of particularly brittle. I was a little worried about like breaking them as I was putting them into the stealth burner tool head. I went ahead and after testing the kind of stock fans, I swapped in some GDS time fans. In terms of noise level, I think the GDS time and the stock fans were about the same. One wasn't noticeably louder than the other. This is an ABS printer. So if you're basically always printing ABS at moderate speeds, the cooling isn't all that important, but I just felt more comfortable switching out and using the GDS time fans. Now let's get into the build, the issues I had and the improvements I think that they could make to the kit. My build honestly went together relatively smoothly, at least in comparison to some of the problems I've seen people running into on the Voron Discord and troubleshooting channels. And that's for various you know, manufacturers of Voron kits. I was able to stream the whole process, show you guys the issues I ran into and nothing really stopped me cold in my track besides you know putting to this together fairly late and getting a bit tired this is a bit of a nitpick but the power cable that they provide that goes from the skr pico to send five volts over to the big tree pi it works it plugs into the gpio on the big tree tech pi but I think it was designed for a traditional Pi. When I used that, I had to basically stretch it out to get it plugged in and kind of pull them together. Now you could of course put your electronics a little bit closer together, but then you would have kind of like a droopy saggy wires that I think would be visually unappealing. To get it just a little bit more visually appealing, I recrimped and got longer lengths so that I could go kind of hide it behind the board. So that's a really nitpicky thing. It works without it. You can make an accommodation for it but I think that they could easily make that change and people would just kind of be able to hide any excess cable. And now we're gonna get into the Kirigami bed frame issues that I experienced. These are by far kind of the most frustrating things and it's kind of hard because some of it was actually because of, I'd say lack of documentation and the parts that I needed. And you know, I wasn't sure if I was using the right parts because they got these older non-stealth version of the parts and these new stealth versions and depending on which you know, video you saw somebody building, they might be using different parts. Basically, there were four different problems with the Kirigami bed frame. I ran into them. I've seen other people on both the Kirigami GitHub, on Discord, and on other you know troubleshooting groups note that they've had the problem. But other people I met at like Earth and have seen online say that they didn't. So your mileage may vary. The first issue I had was the frame thickness. I measured it to be somewhere between 2.3 and 2.5. Spec, I believe, on the Kirigami GitHub says it should be exactly two millimeters with a variant 0.2. But that difference in thickness caused some of the stealth parts of the Kirigami kit to not slide on to the frame all that well. 
And I ended up solving that in a couple of ways. I initially kind of used a file to file down some of the excess kind of plastic that was causing it to not be able to fit together. And the other solution is just to switch back to the old non-stealth version. You have to be really careful when you're fitting the bed into some of these parts, especially this nut block, because those flanges need to be perfectly co-planar with the carriages and if your part is a little bit too tight it could cause it to bow out and basically over constrain the z axis when i got it all put together i noticed it was a bit over constrained because i couldn't kind of just let the bed fall that's not necessarily something that the bed needs to do there was no real binding i think that their powder coating process whatever it is probably adds you know like a fraction of a millimeter of thickness to it and that puts it maybe slightly out of spec and then it just caused it to not mate up with my parts. The next problem I noticed was kind of in the same vein and that was with the frame holes that you use to mount the frame to the carriages. And I think it was, again, because the powder coating was just a little bit too thick. But I noticed that I could barely fit them through the holes to fit into the carriage. You need that carriage and those flanges to kind of self align and since there was like no wiggle room whatsoever between the screws and the carriage. They couldn't self-align and that ended up exacerbating that kind of over constrained problem. So I, you know, fixed that by kind of filing out those holes a little bit so that there was a little bit more kind of wiggle room. And I felt like that's in combination with um, kind of either filing out the nut block or using the older nut block kind of freed it up to the point where I was really, really happy with how the bed frame moved. The third kind of small issue that I had with the Kirigami bed frame was in regards to clearances when I was trying to do my Z calibration offset. Basically, I moved it up to the top point and noticed that at the top level that even when I compressed the bed springs as much as possible, my tool head was rubbing up against the print bed. And I noticed that that was because the thermal fuse was starting to Kind of bump into the frame. There's a little slot in the Kirigami bed frame that is supposed to allow for the thermal fuse, but I had to mount the bed to the Kirigami bed frame in a way that pushed it all the way towards the back to make sure that my tool head would reach the front of the bed and not lose any print area that way. And then when I did that, it caused the thermal fuse to run in when I compressed it. So I ended up fixing that by again fouling away just probably like two millimeters of material where their interference was and that allowed me to compress it enough so that I didn't have to worry about the print head running into it. That could be easily fixed by them by moving the thermal fuse hole by like three to four millimeters towards the inside. Again, this is one of those weird things where some other people noticed that same interference and other people didn't and your mileage may vary. The last issue I kind of ran into was just some confusion about how to wire it. The Kirigami bed is a mod, and so the default Boron v manual doesn't go over how to do the wiring or assemble it at all. There, of course, is no documentation from the FormBot team on how to wire the parts that are provided for them. If you do want to enhance it with some other you know, parts like the NeoPixel and the Wagos and stuff like that, you kind of have to Blend together a bunch of documentation to figure out the best way. Now, this is being a little bit picky. Of course, you don't have to do that. And I think most people are going to be able to get it put together well. But, you know, just having documentation would have helped me realize whether or not I was doing anything wrong. Again, I was able to get through all of this. I did it on stream so you can see all the solutions I did. It would have been a much better experience with some documentation. That was the kind of build process and the issues that I had. I did want to talk about some value adds that I think that they could maybe add to the kits that would make it a little bit more appealing in the ever growing kind of competitive markets that we have for these kits. Yeah, all of those things I basically had to buy from a third party and of the LDL wiring kits, if they can include those and really kind of help seal the deal for this being pretty complete. I think if they were to actually include the thermal fuse in the bed, like some other manufacturers of these beds are doing, then that would kind of, you know, completely take out the possibility for running into any interference. It would also make the build process a whole lot quicker and easier for people. I think that they could maybe add some little optionals or extras that wouldn't be all that expensive for them, especially them being, I believe in China, they're really, really close to manufacturing for a lot of these things. So it's like the daylight or rainbow LEDs would be a nice value add, maybe added in as an optional sequin LEDs for the tool head 
would be really, really cool to see as well as a way to get power up to them. I know it's a pretty delicate balance they have to strike between trying to keep the you know, total price of the kits as low as possible. Any one extra product means that they have extra QA that they have to worry about for packaging it together. Anything that's like the inline, you know, thermal fuse will be another process, which will be more expensive for them. But I do think that they could kind of make the build process a whole lot easier if they did some things like that. Next, I wanted to talk about print quality and tuning. And I gotta say, like pretty much straight out of the gate, as soon as I got it printing, I was pretty happy with the quality of prints that were coming off of it. And then after I went through the tuning process, I've been really, really happy with the prints that are coming off of it. So much so that I've been printing parts for itself and then also other printers. And then I've also been doing some client work prints on this, basically rapid prototyping for a guy who's having some CNC car parts done. For the tuning process, I don't think I did anything special, kind of a combination of stuff from the Voron guide, the Clipper guide, Andrew Ellis's tuning guide, which I highly recommend you read through, and then Orca Slicer's calibration and tuning. So I guess that brings us to the conclusion and question. All that said, can I recommend the FormBot V0.2 slash R1 kit? And I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, I think that this is the right kit for some of you guys watching. Definitely, if you are kind of a budget-oriented person who's maybe trying to decide whether they wanna self-source or get this kit, Definitely this kit is probably gonna save you a whole lot of money over self-sourcing, whether or not it's gonna be worth it versus other kits. I'll try to give you some pros and cons. For the pros, I was competitively priced, as I already mentioned, it's capable of producing a working printer. I'm not gonna be said about all the printers on AliExpress. It's a great starting platform for folks looking to kind of mod their printer. It's a good balance of feature ads and price. There are more expensive kits, which have more and or different feature ads, things like a Pico umbilical, which is essentially a smart version of the V0, umbilical higher end hot ends, like the Boron Revo that you can get in some kits. I know that there has been some attitude towards the Formbot kits in the past in terms of them not being the greatest quality. I can't speak to those kits and those builds and how well they were built by those people, but I do think that generally looking at their offering from the V0 to the V0.1 to now the V0.2 and V0.2 R1, they have improved their kits. They've gotten better in terms of the quality of the parts and their completeness. That's really, really great to see. So now for the cons, the biggest thing that comes to mind for me is no documentation. Compared to offerings from folks like Fisec and LDO and even Cyber, they have GitHub, they have documentation sites. That makes you have, I think, a lot more confidence in building a kit. I think most people are going to be able to get this kit put together, even you know lacking that documentation, hopefully, especially with the documentation I've provided. But yeah, that's something I think that they really can and should improve on. The toolhead fans are something I really suggest you just go ahead and buy some replacements from those out of the gate and just use something like GDS time fans or Sunons. The CHC V6 they include is a workable option, but again, with the lack of documentation, I ended up cracking the ceramic while I was trying to hot tighten it. The final thing is the Kirigami bed frame. I have to give it a con for the issues that I ran into, other people have noted they haven't ran into it while others have. I can only present the experience I had while building it. Maybe they can get it closer to spec. Maybe their newer printers aren't having the same issues. Nothing that was kind of completely unsolvable, but it was definitely a little bit of a troublesome point so that is it. Now it is up to you to take all of this info and decide. I think most of you watching will be able to build a great little printer out of this kit. But is there another kit that might suit your needs better for the price and or the features that you're looking for? You have to decide that. If you are interested in the LDO V0.2 S1 kit, I do have one of those and I will be doing a live stream of it and then review similar to this down the road. So subscribe if you wanna see that and leave a comment and tell me if you have any questions about it. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for everybody who did tune into those streams and everybody who's tuned into this video. If you made it to the end of the video, go ahead and leave in the comments. Let's say we build space shuttles with gardening tools. That's the Voron kind of theme and I just love that aspect of their printers and their design system. So thanks again. I will see you in the next one. Peace.